My name is Ehsan Naini and I'm a research geoscientist working for ICON Science. The title of my talk is a Structural Deep Migration and Quantitative Interpretation. Most geoscientists are familiar with NMO stretch, and most geoscientists with scientific processing background are probably familiar with the fact that migration operator also has a similar impact on uh, dipping events. In fact, it stretches the waveform. Now, what is less known is the impact on quantitative interpretation. That is everything that we do after migration, which includes seismic uh, ABO analysis, uh, inversion, and well tie, and, and uh, overall uh, quantitative interpretation workflow. Here, I explain that problem a little bit more, and I'll also introduce some remedy. Uh, however, you may have a better idea uh, as soon as you are familiar with the problem. The outline of my talk is a quick introduction on, uh, or a reminder on 1D convolution, uh, quantitative interpretation, uh, and migration stretch and a stalled uh, formula. This is summarized in, the, in, in this picture here. So on the left, we have the impedance profile. Those are layer properties, could be acoustic and or elastic properties. And in the middle, we have the reflectivity, or reflectivity series. On the right hand side, uh, we convolve that reflectivity with the wavelet, and that is uh, the principle behind, behind convolution, which states that migration is related to the reflectivities uh, by uh, a linear uh, formula uh, explained by convolution. The first application is well to seismic time. This is when we try to estimate a wavelet in which we use that for seismic inversion. Um, but also we try to match the seismic and well data by accounting for some of the shift, uh, time shift or phase uh, mismatches. Everything is formulated here. Capital R is explaining the convolution in a matrix uh, format. And on the right hand side, we have the seismic image. The second application is for seismic inversion. In this case, we are uh, looking to invert for uh, impedance properties. Uh, and we use weak contrast approximations uh, that effectively convert Zupritz equations to a linear uh, sets of equations um, and relate uh, those to seismic uh, image. Uh, everything is explained by this formula. Uh, G matrix has the convolution embedded. Uh, M is the properties we are after. And again, on the right hand side, we have the seismic image. Uh, so in, in this case, Effectively, what we do, we synthesize the seismic. Uh, we look uh, for the differences between the synthesized seismic and the migrated seismic. Uh, and the residuals uh, are minimized until we recover the true uh, properties, impedance properties. So in summary, uh, well tie and inversion, uh, which are the fundamental and building blocks of quantitative interpretation workflows, uh, they all use convolution in one way, uh, in one form or the other. So convolution is the building block for various applications in quantitative interpretation workflows, such as seismic inversion, colored inversion, and well tie. One D convolution uh, expresses the vertical resolution uh, correctly. However, uh, it ignores the resolution limits with depth, offset, and depth, as well as acquisition geometry. The impact on depth. We discuss in this presentation anything beyond uh, are really be, uh, uh, not part of this uh, presentation and are uh, properly discussed in some of the references that I have in my uh, paper at the EAG uh, conference uh, as well as the one published in the Leading Edge. Uh, overall, uh, briefly speaking, uh, those effects, uh, the, the limitations on uh, depth, offset, and accretion geometry are really expressed by point spread functions. As I said, those are beyond this talk, and we only focus on the impact on deep. So let's go back to some basic. Uh, the image on the left shows a dipping event on, uh, uh, with normal incident rays on the stack section and also on the uh, migrated section. So as told, for the first time, uh, for a constant velocity medium, came up with the equation that relates the stack and uh, migrated uh, images. And that is uh, the tangent of theta uh, equals to the sine of uh, phi, phi angle in, in this image. 
in the FK domain, uh, we can uh, visualize it perhaps easier, and that is shown on the right hand uh, side image. Uh, so, as you can see, the top right figure shows the pre stack uh, dipping events, and once we migrate them, events are moving up dip, uh, and in the FK domain for each K, the frequency shifts towards lower uh, frequencies. To make it easier, this image explains that uh, um, shift towards lower frequencies. So the solid line is the pre-migrated uh, event, uh, and once migrated is the dash line, and for each K, the frequency is shifted uh, towards lower frequencies, uh, and that is governed by the velocity of the median. This effect is not captured in 1D convolution. Now, that is important because effectively for seismic inversion, we try to match the seismic image uh, with what we get from 1D convolution, that is the synthesized image. And if there is any effect uh, that is in the seismic image that is not captured by 1D convolution, the residual is fed back to the model. So effectively, it would bias the outcome of seismic inversion. Colored inversion is uh, a slightly different well, in fact, it is very different to deterministic type inversion. In color inversion, we design an operator to match the seismic spectrum to that of Earth spectrum, such as the one shown on the right-hand side. However, in colored inversion, there is also a convolution um, uh, included, and that is when the, uh, when the filter applies to the seismic image. Uh, that filter assumes horizontal layering. So if there is any effect on the seismic image, again, that uh, a spectral match, uh, which boosts the low frequencies, would bias that uh, further. As mentioned, convolution is also present in well time. And in this case, assuming we have a well cutting through the dipping event, uh, the idea is to recover the wavelet. And if there is a stretch, that could uh, be passed to the corresponding wavelet. It's not all bad news. Uh, there are some solutions and we could address for this in uh, forward modeling or we can do a deconvolution uh, to remove the migration stretch. For forward modeling, we can use a 3D convolution instead of 1D convolution, such as the one proposed by Lecomte and her colleagues in 2015, or a simpler solution as proposed by Cheret in 2013, which effectively uses a Stoll formula uh, to convert a 1D wavelet or a 1D uh, um, convolution to 3D convolution, uh, but governed by the Stolt equation, as opposed to Lecomte solution, which is uh, using really the point spread functions. Cheret solution is uh, effectively a one point spread function for the entire uh, process. You could argue that uh, this is a point spread function with perfect illumination, because in this case, we are only recovering the dip effects as mentioned. Uh, so we are ignoring uh, all the other factors that are affecting seismic resolution post-migration as a result of depth, dip, and accretion geometry. A simpler solution, which is effectively what I propose, and it was triggered after uh, seeing uh, Cheret's presentation five years ago, is to formulate the solution as a deconvolution. This has some advantages. Because if we have applications such as well time, colored inversion, seismic inversion, and those can have different flavors, then converting the 1D forward modeling uh, to 3D convolution may not be a straightforward. And each of those applications may handle the problem differently. So with deconvolution, we treat the solution as a data conditioning. So what we, once we have the seismic image, the migrated image, we apply this deconvolution uh, again, using uh, a Stolt uh, formula explained earlier, and we remove the stretch effect uh, going forward. That seismic image now, after the convolution, can be used for well time or all the other inversion applications, and we can be sure that it's consistent across them all. To give you a better idea, some uh, examples. On the left-hand side, we have the true impedance model. In the middle, we have a synthetic image that simulates the migration uh, stretch over dipping events. 
And on the right hand side, you can see what happens to that image once we deconvolve the stretch. The impact is more pronounced uh, when we invert that uh, image to impedance properties. Uh, so again, you see in the, in the middle image uh, suffers from those biases over dipping reflectors uh, and the corresponding impedance is biased uh, or shows as uh, harder uh, uh, properties. After the convolution, uh, the estimated impedance is very similar to the one uh, which is the, the reality effectively. That is the image on the left hand side. Now seismic inversion always has some uh, background model or low frequency models. Um, so if we uh, remove that and look at the uh, relative outputs, and that is really only inverting uh, the seismic image itself. Uh, so all the information are coming from the seismic uh, directly, um, and no background or low frequency model is involved here. Again, this is to show the effect a little bit clearer, and you can see that uh, our dipping uh, events shown with arrows, uh, we have a bias, and after deconvolution, that bias is removed uh, and is uh, comparable to the true model on the left hand side. Colored inversion, as I said, uh, convolution appears in a different format here. Uh, it effectively convolves the seismic image with an operator uh, shown here uh, and boosts the low frequencies such that we obtain an image that is similar to uh, Earth impedance properties. And again, you see uh, some uh, bias here in the middle image and after the convolution that, uh, that um, bias is removed. Uh, so hopefully you get an idea that this conditioning applies to the image once and all the other applications can be, uh, can be performed after conditioning and we know that the input is consistent uh, across them all. Seismic uh, to well tie, again assuming that, uh, that well cutting through the dipping event uh, and here you can clearly see that um, uh, the, the estimated wavelet is a stretched version of the true wavelet on the uh, far right hand side. And after the convolution, the estimated wavelet is very similar uh, to the true wavelet. One can argue that with the stretch wavelet uh, estimated on the left hand side, if we use that wavelet for seismic inversion, and because in seismic inversion we effectively deconvolve the wavelet, uh, that would account for the stretch effect automatically. And this is true, but what happens is the problem shifts to the uh, flat reflectors because that. Uh, wavelet with, uh, with a stretch uh, effect is not the right wavelet for dipping reflectors. And the conditioning step we are proposing here uh, effectively doesn't touch uh, the flat events, it only deconvolves the stretch from dipping reflectors. And no matter where the wells are located, uh, going forward you can estimate the wavelet which is uh, correct for that location. To move on to more practical examples, I start with the same model uh, uh, which we used uh, uh, earlier. So here is the RTM uh, equivalent of that model. And we see things are looking a little bit more complex uh, than before. Uh, and as I said, if we want to handle this on the forward modeling side of things, we can formulate 1D convolution as a 3D convolution using point spread functions. And you see uh, three examples of point spread functions in, in this image and the differences. Our solution relies on the Stoll formula, and we only use one point spread function for the entire image. So it's a really a first order approximation. Nonetheless, we go ahead and use these, uh, or this point spread function to, our, uh, to perform our deconvolution uh, and see the impact. In this image, we see the recovered or the inverted impedance model in the, in the middle and the residual on the right hand side. And that is performed on the original RTM image. Now, if we perform our uh, conditioning, that is our deconvolution using the stall type uh, point spread functions, um, then we see that we uh, remove that low frequency residual and effectively obtain an impedance model which is uh, closer to the reality. Moving on to real data, uh, uh, I had um, better examples, but unfortunately I cannot show this 
uh, on the on the public uh, platform uh, so i had to use another example uh, but in this case unfortunately it doesn't have that much diff uh, so what we did here uh, we performed uh, uh, pointer spread functions uh, deconvolution those are varying pointer spread functions across the image uh, and you kind of see the impact uh, before and after and really that's the point if we look at uh, the data in the migrated world or in the in the reflectivity uh, domain which is what you see now uh, we don't really see the impact uh, pronounced uh, um, uh, nicely now if we invert that data and go to the uh, acoustic impedance domain uh, and i'm showing you the relative uh, property here that means i haven't really added uh, the low frequency model uh, uh, to this image uh, we see uh, the zoom uh, on the box on the right hand side that is applied uh, applying inversion uh, on the original image uh, or using the image after uh, deconvolving the pointer spread functions and you can clearly see uh, there are a lot of details coming in uh, especially in that uh, uh, target region on the uh, on the black box uh, so that may give you an idea, you know, the sort of information we can recover and uh, what we can do uh, is really go ahead to the original image and boost the low frequencies in a way artificially. But again, you see that this is not sufficient uh, and there are some uh, tiny events that are captured uh, a lot better if we do the deconvolution deterministically rather than dealing with it in an uh, in a in a statistical manner. One final remark, and that is on full waveform inversion. Uh, really, for uh, full waveform inversion, it is uh, uh, the, the modeling engine is based on finite difference uh, type modeling, and that is really um, uh, modeling the entire physics correctly. Of course, you can formulate form uh, FWI acoustically or elastically, uh, but uh, still, in finite difference modeling, there is no convolution. Uh, so full waveform inversion as a whole doesn't suffer from that uh, type of events. There is no migration anymore. Uh, and if we can use full waveform inversion for quantitative interpretation uh, one day, then we shouldn't really uh, worry about the, uh, the type of errors and biases that I explained here. However, that is a long way to go. Uh, it's an active line of research at the moment. But it is promising. Uh, on this image, you see the initial model on the left-hand side, uh, the uh, FWI applied acoustically, uh, and comparing uh, to the true model uh, up to 12 hertz, which is what we use for uh, FWI in this case, and you see a very close match. So overall, I introduced a first-order approximation to uh, model and remove the migration stretch. I argued that by formulating this as a deconvolution, the problem becomes a conditioning step. Uh, and once you remove that stretch deterministically, you can use the corresponding migrated image for all the other applications. And you know the input to them is correctly. It works in practice. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, rooms for uh, more work and more research. Uh, one could argue how large uh, should uh, the dips be so that we see an effect like that. Um, or, of course, using point spread functions, uh, as, a, uh, as I explained in the real data example, uh, completely. And uh, what is the effect if you use different imaging algorithms? As an acknowledgement, I'd like to thank uh, Roy White and Adam Cheret uh, for all the help and discussions during this work. Adam's work was uh, a trigger for my work here, uh, and also uh, Bill and Fairfield to help me uh, uh, include a real data example, especially because I couldn't show my other examples on uh, in the public domain. Thank you. And if you like this presentation, there are plenty more on EAGE lecture channel. Uh, please go ahead and en enjoy them all.